Last month, an article appeared in the Wisconsin Law Journal, publication of the State Bar of Wisconsin, uh, regarding the statute which requires courts to consider domestic abuse um, and domestic violence in making orders regarding custody and pa placement. And the article was about a study that looked at a number of divorce cases to see what, uh, whether the statute was having any effect. And what the study shows, as reflected in the article, is that the fact that there have been domestic violence, domestic abuse, in a case didn't affect whether or not the parties were awarded joint legal custody and didn't seem to affect the amount of placement that went to the abuser, which is virtually always the, uh, the father in the case. Um, and the article seemed to indirectly criticize courts for ignoring the statute that the issue of domestic violence is, is supposed to play a role in um, orders regarding custody and physical placement. Um, it's always risky to talk on a subject like this because I don't want anything that I say to possibly be construed in any way as defending, minimizing, rationalizing, uh, in any which way anybody who commits any form of domestic violence. And domestic violence to me includes not just uh, physical but also uh, verbal and emotional abuse. Uh, in fact, in this office, we have a zero tolerance policy. And I have, on a couple of occasions, fired a client who violated that. Uh, for one thing, uh, uh, the simple rule which you learn as a kid is keep your hands to yourself uh, applies in relationships as well as everything else in life. Um, verbal violence and verbal abuse is uh, a little harder to diagnose, uh, but to the extent we can, uh, certainly we, as all good lawyers, uh, we tell our clients it's inappropriate and they shouldn't be doing that. So I don't want anything I say to be taken in the context of either minimalizing or certainly not defending that behavior. But my point and problem with the article is it makes the assumption that there is a connection between domestic violence and custody and placement issues. And let's take a look at custody first, because that's the easier one to discuss. Um, what the article seems to suggest is that domestic violence victims should not be put in a position of having to communicate and deal with their abusers any more than is, is absolutely minimally necessary, and that to order joint legal custody in situations where there is domestic abuse or domestic violence is to force them to communicate to reach agreements regarding major decisions regarding the children. Uh, the problem with that analysis is that uh, uh, it ignores the law in the state of Wisconsin, which is pretty important, I think. Uh, it's not what the statute says, and I understand that courts don't tend to read it the way I'm about to say, uh, and at least one appellate court reads it differently. But here's how I read it. The statute says not that in a, grant, a case granting joint legal custody, the parties are required to jointly agree on major decisions or even consult with each other. It's not what it says. What it says is that they both independently have the ability to make major decisions themselves with neither one's power being superior to the others. So essentially, it's more like several custody. If you look at the term joint and several together in each of them, it's really several custody rather than joint. And in addition, the statute defines six major decisions, as the parties can agree on other things to be major decisions. But of the six of them, uh, four of them almost never come up and can't think of any case in history of this state, at least that I know about, where a parties have had to discuss whether children uh, marry, drive an automobile, or join the military. Uh, and you're dealing with kids, uh, those issues don't seem to come up a whole lot. Um, on rare occasions, um, and I've had one or two over my career, where the issue of non-emergency medical procedures have arisen, but again, it's extraordinarily rare. Choice of religion arises in a few very, very rare instances, but again, it's usually resolved with 
uh, each party getting their own Sunday, taking the church, uh, the children to church wherever they want to. Um, and the only one in a, defined as a major decision in the statute, which comes up with any frequency whatsoever, is choice of schools. And that's usually fairly easy to determine based upon historically where the kids went to school or if it's a choice between public and private, who's going to pay for it, or if it's just public school, uh, who lives in the school district the requisite amount of time. And those issues don't come up a whole lot. Um, so what the authors of the study have wrong is that granting joint legal custody does not require people to talk to each other, communicate with each other. It just gives them individually the power to make certain decisions that almost never come up anyway. Physical placement's a little more difficult, and that's because there is a differentiation, at least in my mind, between somebody, again, we'll look at the father being usually the perpetrator of the violence. Um, sometimes it's the woman, but most of these cases we're looking at, it's, it's, it's the man. Um, being granted unsupervised time with the children because he's not a threat to the children as opposed to supervised time because he is. Once we're, and remember, it's harm to the children at risk, not harm to the mother. So here's the most outrageous statement I'm about to make, at least today. It is conceivable that somebody could commit domestic violence and still be a father who the children should be seeing on an unsupervised basis. If so, then the issue shouldn't so much be the amount of time, because once we're past the hurdle that the time doesn't need to be supervised, the amount of time becomes more a distinction of amount rather than type, and is a totally different issue. Is there a significant difference the children would see the perpetrator uh, four days out of 14, seven, five days out of 14, six. I mean, it doesn't make all that much difference. The exchange makes a huge difference because you want to make sure that the victim is safe at the exchanges, and sometimes you do exchanges at safe places or some other way to make sure that the uh, victim is safe during the exchanges. Sometimes third parties are used for that purpose. But mental health and child welfare experts that I've talked to believe that, in general, children are better if they have an experiential relationship with both parents. And they benefit, that means, from actually spending time with the father as well with the mother, again, unless that they're in danger or there are other overriding issues, such as substance abuse, mental illness, or something like that, where they shouldn't have direct experience with the father. So in those instances, again, the fact that there is domestic violence does not necessarily mean that the children, unless they're the victims of it, and unless they would be harmed, shouldn't have time with the father. So maybe the reason that the statute doesn't have any direct effect is because it shouldn't. In our system of family law, the overriding interest is supposed to be the best interest of the children. And while it would probably be best for the victim to have as little contact with the perpetrator as possible, which may include supervised or third-party exchanges. It may include, for her viewpoint, less time of the children with him, uh, less opportunity for him to make any decisions. But sometimes courts have to make difficult decisions as to the best interests of the children as opposed to the best interests of one of the parents. And in those instances, what the study says to me is that the court chooses on the side of the best interests of the children. Again, as I said at the beginning, this is nowhere to be seen as at all minimizing, depreciating, or diminishing in any sense the terrible aspects of anybody who commits domestic violence in any form whatsoever. It is, however, a suggestion, perhaps, that sometimes courts have to choose 
between the lesser of harms, and sometimes those are difficult choices. But in our system, whatever can be done to protect children uh, who are the innocent victims of divorce um, seems to be, uh, would seem to me at least, uh, to be the most important uh, factor, the most important uh, thing that the court needs to protect in these items, even though sometimes it makes difficult choices. Um, anyway, that's my spin on this. For more, uh, if you're uh, interested, uh, read my article in the Wisconsin Law Journal, write a monthly column for them on various items in family law, and my column in their uh, January 2019 issue is on the subject, and uh, it'll be posted uh, on my website as well. And finally, um, for the case law analysis, uh, please go to wisconsincaselawfinder.com, uh, which is uh, our website, which will allow you to subscribe to family law cases, keep up with the latest developments in family law in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm.